Hey guys, so according to Edge Magazine, who just released a review of Bloodborne, if you're one of the people who complained that Dark Souls 2 was too easy, then you're to blame for Bloodborne being so difficult. They call Bloodborne a brutal riposte to the player base that thinks it's seen it all before, and from what I've played I think I have to agree with them. When you pick this up on March 24th, you can't just expect to die. That's something everybody expects when they pick up a Souls game for the first time. No, this game is going to challenge the muscle memory that you've learned for the past six years, and it's going to punish you if you play the same way as you did in the last three Souls games. You're going to feel out of your depth, and I expect that you're going to have to adapt. I also expect that this is welcome news for most of you. So here's an example of something I guarantee you'll do at least once. You're going to accidentally heal yourself when you go to switch weapons. Uh, that's because they've changed two-handing from triangle to L1, the bastards. Triangle is now your dedicated healing button through which you'll accidentally and purposefully consume blood vials. And this action of healing is fast, just like every other thing in Bloodborne. You dodge faster, the enemies attack faster. Where the Souls games are deliberate and methodical, Bloodborne is frantic and dynamic. Gone are the days where you just hang back and respond to your enemy. In Bloodborne, you need to attack first, you need to stagger your enemy, and you need to be too fast for them to respond. So, to start with recent news, you guys should expect to be able to play with your mates a lot more easily in Bloodborne, because there's this new feature in co-op called the Watchword. Now, the Watchword is essentially a password that's eight digits long that both you and your friend set so that you can connect more seamlessly with each other's worlds. And so you're probably thinking, oh hey, this new summoning mechanic, it makes the game so much easier, right? Well, don't worry, they found a way to balance it out. Because whenever you summon somebody in co-op, it also summons this bell maiden, and she's not friendly. When she appears, she'll ring her bell, and she'll summon an invader into the world. So whenever you invite somebody into your world to help you, you're also inviting invaders into your world to kill you. Just to even the playing field, I like this change a lot, and there are even going to be areas where this bell maiden is present from the very beginning, forcing you to engage in PvP. So obviously, invaders have been confirmed too, and apart from this invader summoning mechanic, it seems like they work much the same as in the Souls games. Once they invade, they kill you and they get rewarded. The invader in this picture is wielding a rapier that folds out into a pistol. And on that topic, we've seen a total of nine transformable weapons thus far. Uh, though someone can correct me if I'm wrong. There's that saw cleaver, which you all know, there's a sword that acts as the arm of a hammer, a longsword that sheaths into a great sword, the rapier gun I just mentioned, uh, there's also a whip that stacks up into a cane, there's the handheld scythe that attaches to a longer folding blade, there's the long axe that shortens into itself, there's the thin sword that snaps in half for dual wielding, and we have this one image of a character that's holding a sort of cleaver type weapon that clearly also doubles as a kind of mechanical gun. Such a cool selection of weapons. And when you start the game, it actually gives you three of these transformable weapons to choose between. It reminded me of choosing a Pokemon. There's the saw cleaver, there's the axe, and there's the cane that turns into a whip. And you also get to choose between two guns, the blunderbuss, which is like a shotgun, or the pistol. Personally, I don't really mind what I start with, because I am gunning for whatever build lets me use that scythe. I call dibs on that one. Simply due to the burden of design, I feel like there's going to be less weapons in the game, but there's so much depth to each weapon that whatever you use really defines your character and how you play. And most of you will be playing more aggressively, let me tell you. With the new regain mechanic, you get health back when you attack, right after getting hit, and this mechanic changes so much. I think that this mechanic exists in tandem with you actually taking more damage in Bloodborne than any other Souls game, as enemies attack really fucking fast in this game, so players who play more cautiously will find themselves getting severely punished. It's not just about avoiding attacks in this game, it's also about how you deal with getting hit. For example, if you just leg it every time you take damage and run back and heal, you're gonna run out of those healing potions. You kind of need to replenish some of your health whenever you take damage, just to minimize the impact that has. 
And running out of potions is a thing in this game, because as far as we know, you can only get more blood vials by finding them in the world. So expect to be farming these a fair bit if you use them too often. So if you get hit until you fall down and you die, well there's this new element to the death mechanic. Enemies who kill you appear to absorb your souls, or in this game, blood echoes. Whether this makes them stronger, we don't know, but it is a cool change. The enemy who took your blood echoes will have glowing eyes and an aura, meaning that you actually have to overcome the enemy that bested you, meaning that you have to do better than the last time where you died. It's actually a mechanic that we've seen appropriated by a couple of Souls-like titles like Lords of the Fallen and Sultan Sanctuary. It works perfectly because it halts your ability to just run back to where you died. You actually have to fight back to where you died as well. So where do you spend these echoes? Well, there seems to be a new hub area called the Hunter's Dream. And this area seems to function just like the Nexus did in Demon's Souls, featuring, from what I count to be, 11 different headstones that warp you to different parts of the world. And I say that it is separate from the rest of the game's world, because a narrator refers to warping as returning to reality. Therefore, I think it's pretty safe to say that the dream is separate, a place that hunters go to rest and recuperate before adventuring out into the relevant parts of the world. And I'd also say that the areas that we warp to are part of one interconnected city, but that warping gives you a shortcut to a different checkpoint within the city. I think that this is the most logical thing to conclude based on the information we have. And within the hub, a few other things have been spotted. There's a fireplace where you can upgrade your weapon with bloodstones. There's a living doll with the same voice as the Maiden in Black from Demon's Souls, who I would guess has the same purpose of leveling you up. Uh, she's asked the question, what do you desire, after all, so that kind of speaks for itself to me. Let's finish on the story. This trailer is one of the only ones that isn't exclusive, actually. I managed to get a source file from Sony. So what is Yarnum, the city we're dropped into? Yarnum is the home of blood ministration. You need only unravel its mystery. But where's an outsider like yourself to begin? Easy, with a bit of Yarnum blood of your own. This is Lasefka, who appears in the opening cinematic of the game. He gives us our vague objective, kind of like Ring the Bell of Awakening was in Dark Souls. We have to unravel the mystery of Yarnum with the blood of the city to help us. But how does blood help us? The blood makes us human, makes us more than human, makes us human no more. I believe this statement describes the sequence of events. The blood we have makes us human, and then we are more than human. We become increasingly beast-like, uh, with increased ability, perhaps supernatural strength, and then we are human no more, and the transformation to becoming a beast is complete. Perhaps this is the transformation that gripped all of Yarnum, and perhaps we willingly become part of this transformation in the opening sequence, infecting ourselves with blood that makes us stronger. To finish, I'd also like to talk about what you can expect from this channel going into Bloodborne. I've spent a long time thinking about all the different series ideas I could do, and thinking about what I've done badly in Dark Souls 2 and what I could do better, and I think I'm starting Bloodborne really strong. With Dark Souls 2, I went in anticipating all these amazing characters and this deep lore, and it wasn't really like that. And I was forced to adapt on the spot with 10 things and story mode, and I had to abandon my walkthrough series because the game was so damn easy. Things like that really threw me off. But with Bloodborne, I'm really confident based on what I've played that these series will stick. Uh, one of them is focused around community involvement, another one focused around how hard the game is shaping up to be, and I also have one series that's going to help us delve into the lore of an entirely different universe. Uh, the day before Bloodborne releases, I think I'm going to announce all the series that are coming, so you guys can get used to the idea of what I'm going to be putting out. And I think I will tell you the day before release rather than now, because some people have been known to copy the structure of the channel, so I think I'll keep it under wraps and let you guys know a little bit later. But I also have to ask, is there anyone in the audience who isn't actually getting Bloodborne? 
I realize that there are going to be those people. Not everyone can afford a PS4, it's just not justifiable to some people who have an Xbox or a PC, and I get that. Uh, obviously I'd love you all to be involved in this, but for those of you who can't play the game, I hope you still enjoy watching my content on it, because it's going to be the heart of this channel for the next few months. Uh, that said, I do have some Souls content planned later this year, so look out for that. And thanks for sticking with the channel if you don't play Bloodborne. But regardless, I'll see you guys all again soon. Cheers, and thanks so much for watching. Bye-bye.